is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Vorkosigan Saga, book one, Shards of Honor, <laughs> chapters 11, 12, and 13. In these chapters, it turns out that Cordelia's own people are a lot scarier than a, a lot of the Barriarans turned out to be. This is really distressing, you guys. This was some yellow wallpaper shit. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. I, I I have a kitten here that I'm trying to like pacify. Your girl is is very loud and very clawy, uh, and so I, if you can hear her in the background, I'm just kind of waiting for her to like fall asleep and chill. But um, it, I, I apologize for the the squealy cries of distress. She is totally fine just a little annoyed because i put her in blanket jail which means that she is burritoed up and cannot escape because she just wants to stick claws in my lips thank you very much to jeff for commissioning this episode so these chapters guys wow harrowing i was not prepared for this at all like I kind of figured that her having a relationship with Vorkosigan was going to be something that she kept secret from absolutely everybody. So the fact that she decides to share this information with her mother was truly kind of shocking to me. And I feel like not a great move on her part. <laughs> she escaped the blanket jail. Oh, no. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead and explore the room. Just wander around then. Um. Sorry, I felt if she had been reading the body language from her mother a little bit more, if she had been reading it from the slant of my mother believes all of the shit they've been telling her and expected me to read that speech and was fully on board with this, she would have realized that this didn't like this wasn't the person to confide this sort of thing to which is a shame because you get the impression that her and her mom are quite close so for her to be in this position where it, i'm like you really need to keep this a secret and it's like a major thing that she's in love with somebody you know it sucks but it just felt so clear in that scene that what she was saying was not welcome and not being interpreted as genuine expression of love but as somebody who has been taken advantage of and i mean let's be real the power play that was going on at the time it's very suspect you know i get it she was under his control a prisoner and now she's like but i'm in love with him this sort of thing is going to look very questionable it's going to be, I, I'm not even mad at people who are feeling a way about it. And in some ways, the evidence that winds up getting cited, it makes a little bit of sense, the interpretations that we're coming up with. But at the same time, it is so incredibly insulting how they are insisting that she doesn't know how she herself is feeling that she has been like programmed and there does eventually come a point where she sort of asks herself, how do I know I wasn't? What if I was programmed so well that I'm not aware of it? But I think it's pretty clear that's not what's happening. I am, I am not going to be on some sort of paranoia thing where I think this whole thing. No, I think it's what it looked like. It's not deeper than that. I don't feel like this writer is trying to pull a massive okie doke you know, I just don't see it. That's not the vibe of these books. So 
let's start out with 11. Marsha is trying, like, she comes in to tell Cordelia that they want to talk to you, but he wants to see you alone. And I don't really like that. I don't think you should go talk to him alone. And, you know, just expressing some concern about her safety. And later on, she tries to act like, oh, yeah, all we did was, like, talk about creating this marker for the grave of the, my friend. But her friend is like, that can't be all you did for two whole hours. And it's this sort of thing that really begins to like add up to looking like something else is going on. And it's too bad that like Cordelia didn't really stop and, and think up another excuse that would have slid into place where she could be like, okay, no, it wasn't just that. Here's what we were really doing. And she could like, you know, I, I really, I'm saying this with the like complete acknowledgement that I don't have a, a great suggestion here. There's very little that I feel like she could say that's going to sound harmless. It's always going to be a possibility that she's collaborating with the enemy and that's why it's taking so long. But it seems like she just hadn't really given this a lot of thought. So it, once people begin to sort of poke holes in things, it's not that surprising that they start feeling the way they're feeling about it. Not to excuse some of the other stuff that happens later. But so anyway, he comes to, to speak to her and um, she confronts him about the fact that he didn't actually drug her, like he said. And it turns out, like, he just admits that he didn't, which is really funny, because considering everything, the fact that this man lied about drugging her when he hadn't, and then later on, she's getting lied to about being drugged in, like, what's supposed to be a therapy session, the the just complete reversal of the way that she is treated by her own people, it keeps being mirrored back, really, like... Y'all are not doing yourselves favors here, guys. What do you, Baytons, get it together. Um, so he gives his word to Ilian that he will only speak with her about things regarding his asking her to marry him. Just lies. After having been really careful about giving his word, apparently enough time has passed and I just really want to mention again, you guys, I don't feel like it's made very clear at all how much time has passed by the time we jump to her seeing Vorkosigan again. It's never said, and I kind of went back and checked it out, and I can't find any distinct mention. And I don't know if, I, if I'm missing some context clues that should have told me more about it. I feel like it had to have been said somewhere, but it wasn't said at the start of the chapter where we had jumped forward. And that's where I feel like it should have been to make things clear. So I keep forgetting how much time has passed since they were in the woods together and thinking that it's only been like a week and having to be reminded that it's been months at least. And I don't know why it's, it, it's sort of, kept in such a state of uncertainty. I, I, unless it's just that I missed it, but I've been paying attention and I just don't remember. Um, so anyway, yeah, he pledges his word falsely. And she points out that this is not something that he would normally do. And also the fact that he lied to her face about drugging her is also out of character. And then he says something about like, because she says, uh, you also shot a man out of hand for crimes he didn't participate in. It wasn't out of hand. He had a summary court martial first and it did get things straightened around in a hurry. Anyway, it will satisfy the interstellar judiciary's commission. I'll have them on my hands too. come tomorrow investigating the prisoner abuses. And she says, I think you're getting blood gutted. Individual lives are losing their meaning for you. I had never heard the term blood gutted before. And I'm using the dictionary thing here and I am not, there, it says no definition found. 
but I kind of liked this as as a term and I want to know if this comes from anywhere like this is just like I said it's not something I've heard and the internet isn't really being helpful in this regard but um he doesn't deny what she's saying actually which I found surprising I even thought that he might behave as if he were wounded by the accusation or that he were startled and would stop and like think to himself like oh god is she right but it isn't she's not telling him anything that he hasn't thought about himself already clearly he just reacts yes it's been too long it's i it's time to quit and there was something about the fact that he clearly has already reached this conclusion himself that I really like. I don't want characters who are so lacking in that kind of self-awareness that they can be brought up short by others that easily. Um, so she says at this point, just straight up confronts him about the assassination of the prince. And he explains things to her. And it's so funny because like she acts sort of at one point she says something like it almost makes it understandable after she hears the whole story. And I couldn't help but be like, there's no, there's no almost about it, Cordelia. I feel like it's very understandable, actually. Because it turns out that the prince was kind of a fucking monster. Um, so he explains the way the emperor like slowly ramped him up on trying to get him to do this. And, you know, there was a lot of back and forth but before he actually let him in on like the big secret plan that he was kind of working on. Um, <clears throat> and he says... You saw the prince briefly. I may add that you saw him at his best. Baruchir may have been his teacher once, but the prince surpassed him some time ago. Yikes. Really? Um, but only if he had some saving notion of political service, I think his father would have forgiven him even his vilest personal vices. He was not balanced. And he surrounded himself with men whose interests lay in making him even less balanced. A true nephew of his uncle Yuri. Grishnov meant to rule Baryar through him when he came to the throne. On his own, Grishnov would have been willing to wait, I think. The prince had engineered two assassination attempts on his father in the last 18 months. Here it is. She says, I almost begin to see. But why not just put him out of the way quietly? The idea was discussed. But the emperor is dying. He has run out of time to wait for the problem to solve itself. And eventually he the he gets to the point and is like, he wanted his son to at least die a death that seemed honorable. That was like the last thing that he was able to give him as a gift. Um, and also, there are all of these people that are attached to the prince and just taking him out would not change the... The fact that the the party that was surrounding the prince would then just move to the sun and slide into the power vacuum left by the prince anyway. So you have to get rid of not only like the principal player here, but also all of the people on the sidelines supporting him and trying to weasel their way into further power using him. And uh, so, yeah, doing something that was like a bloodbath, as he calls it, was sort of their only option if they wanted him to also be killed in a way that seemed glorious and brave. Um, and y'all, I, these, these, uh, this just seems fair to me. Is this, is this me being like myself blood gutted? Have I, maybe it's just like the reading of Game of Thrones. But the fact that this this king is really trying to keep some shit from being a complete fucking nightmare if he dies seems responsible. It seems like a good thing to do. I don't even know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am just in this mindset 
where, yeah, it's his child, but it's like you don't recognize your kid anymore because now he has become so – he has enjoys like torturing people in such a way that it can be used to – unbalance him and c cause him to be a danger to himself as well as other people. I just feel it's like, what if Cersei actually saw Joffrey for what he is and she decided to manage that shit herself? It's like the best case scenario, in my opinion, for how this sort of thing could go down without her. Like there, there are plenty of other people who got, caught in the crossfire and wound up being casualties of this that didn't deserve to be part of it. But that's war in general. You know, it just is, unfortunately. War is so stupid. Like, you know, we can war can be fought for good reasons. There can be an overall goal that is noble. But war itself, when you stop and think about it, just have my guys kill as many of your guys as I can and whoever has the most guys left at the end is the winner is truly the most rudimentary, like, juvenile way to solve a problem when you just, like, stop and think about it. It's, it's asinine that we have not evolved past this as our means of, of settling problems. Like, anyway... Um, so, the, uh, he suppressed part of the, um, the news. It could only be a disaster. And then there was Grishnov and the war party and the prince all crying for glory. He had only to step aside and let them rush to their doom. It fits so well. There was a hypnotizing fascination to it, but Chansey. There was even a possibility, leaving events to themselves, that everyone might be killed but the prince, which I was like, oh, God, can you imagine? I was placed right where I was to see the script was followed, goading Serge, making sure he got to the front lines at the right time. And this makes so much sense because I was like in that scene, like, what the fuck is he doing talking to him like this? What is going on? This does not feel like him. And it's, it isn't him. He did a thing on purpose to get the result that he was after. And uh, wow, brutal. Um, so he says, I couldn't even be an honest assassin. assassin. Do you recall me saying I wanted to go into politics? I believe I'm cured of that ambition. And when she asked about Verrutcher, because she's like, you know, he wound up dead. But was that the plan? And he says that, no, he would have been the scapegoat. He would have been the one that was like, you know, it was all his idea and he was the one who got the prince killed and every, you know, and that he probably, if he were still alive, would have gotten even more people killed because he would have tried to press and not see the uh, the danger everybody was in. And the fact that it was Vorkosigan who knew what was up and pulled back actually wound up like saving a lot of lives. Um, and he also says that like the, it was very clear watching Verrutcher that his standing was, was waning and that he was being set up and Verrutcher could tell that was happening, but didn't know why. And, was still trying to goad Vorkos again into losing his temper and couldn't understand why his attempts didn't seem to be working anymore. And it was because Vorkos again, like pitied him and saw what was going on and it just never worked because it seemed so petty and silly in light of the fact that this guy was about to be put in the position that he was, which is so damning. Like, you know, if somebody that normally flies off the handle when you say certain things, just begins to get quiet. That really does sound like a fucking th threat. That sounds like a situation you don't want to be part of. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we are all of us, just is our Vobara's tools. 
Me and my convoy, you, the Escobarans, even old Verutcher. So much for patriotic hoopla and righteous wrath, all a charade. Um, and he says, uh, here it is. I shall not sicken you with the details of Negri's reports, but the emperor said if it wasn't done now, we would all be trying to do it ourselves five or ten years down the road and probably botching the job and getting all our friends killed in a full-scale planet-wide civil war. He's seen two in his lifetime. That was the nightmare that haunted him. A Caligula or a Yuri Vorbara can rule a long time, while the best men hesitate to do what is necessary to stop him and the worst ones take advantage. And I really like that. That there's some. Uh, I'm going to pop open a message that Owen sent me a screenshot the other day because it made me laugh. Um, it's a screenshot from Tumblr. And somebody says, it actually pisses me off so much when characters are like, oh, but if I hurt or kill the bastard who made my life and others a living hell, I'm just as bad as they are. Like, grow up and shoot him. What are you, Catholic? And somebody else replied, but I'm too good to kill anyone, sad face. I'm not. Give me the gun. That's the vibe. And it's it's such a thing to be like, oh, I can't just kill. But like, I am of the belief, and I will never be swayed from this, that the world is just better without certain people in it. And maybe it's unfair to say that, like, I get to make that call or any person gets to make that call that somebody else's life isn't worth the same as others, that their life is fundamentally worth less because they are affecting everybody around them in a profoundly hurtful, negative way. I'm not saying that's like, you know, a system without flaws that this judgment, but I do think that there are points where you're just saving everybody a lot of headache, you know, not to say that I really believe in capital punishment because of our incredibly racist judicial system. That's a whole other kettle of fish. I'm talking about situations such as in The Walking Dead, which I always bring up when I'm trying to talk about how badly things can be written. When you have a group of like 15 people and there's one person in this group of 15 people who keeps risking everybody's lives, who keeps involving like outsiders in shit that is outright dangerous or doing things that are reckless and selfish. Yeah. Kill them. You've got a whole group of people here that are all going to die because of the actions of one person. And you can prevent that. Kill them. I I don't care. I'm so sorry. But like, you know, if that's repeated behavior, if they don't seem to, to understand the gravity of what they have done, if they show no interest in changing as a person and improving their behavior and working, then that's their fault. That's it. So it's the, the whole idea of like people just sort of dithering while some monster continues to do horrible shit and people who don't care that he's a monster and just want power are around like managing to to use that it's just a very real situation and honestly i'm here for it emperor i i'm not mad at you for this i feel like this was just a responsible thing to do he is being the kind of parent that a royal should be ideally like if we're talking about this sort of system obviously not talking about like you know queen elizabeth because that whole situation is slightly different but <laughs> maybe not actually considering well let's not go down that road um and he asks cordelia like was i wrong to do this and she's like look i'm not going to judge you i can love you and i can grieve with you or for you but that's all and I appreciate that statement, but also I wish I could just get her full throated support on this because I just really do think, you know, um, <clears throat> so he finally is like, will you marry me again? And she says, you know that I love you, but Bariar eats its fucking children. I can't, I can't do it. And as much as I understand that this is sort of a reference to what he has just described, it's definitely bigger than that. And she's right in a broader sense. So I get it. 
I w- I didn't even take this as like real criticism of this incident. It was a bigger statement than that. And he's like, well, you know, some people can go through their whole lives without dealing with the politics. And she's like, yes, yeah, some people, not you, though. And then he says, I don't know if I could get a visa for beta colony. And I love this. It's not even just like, well, I can't leave my people because my job's important. You're the one who's supposed to leave. Not at all. He immediately is like, all right, well, let's see. Uh, Would that work? And I was just like, thank you for even considering that she didn't even have to say it. Because God, it's taken as like a a complete given that it's going to be the woman who shakes up her entire life to go and be with her man that she loves. And if she loved him enough, she would give up anything. And men are never expected to like sacrifice in that way. And I just love that there's no hesitation in him at all. It's just a wonder of like, would that work? And she's like, ah. Well, all Barry Yarns are considered war criminals right now. And uh, everybody's kind of drunk on like the fact that we have won a war. And she says, and then there is Komar. I don't remember what the deal is with Komar. Um, He says, I see. I should have trouble getting a job as a judo instructor then. And I could hardly write my memoirs, all things considered. Right now, I think you should ha- you'd have trouble avoiding lynch mobs. I've got to go home for a while anyway. See my family and think things through in peace and quiet. Oh, girl, I'm so sorry to tell you this. My apologies. And <laughs> he says, is there anything you need? And at first she's like, no. But then she says, no, you know what? Lieutenant Rosemont's grave. Would you find it and actually mark it? I'll get you all of his information. And he's like, yes, done. He seems very happy that, that to give her anything that she's, she doesn't really demand anything of him ever. And uh, I think that he appreciates having something he can do for her. Then they kiss for the very first time. Wild. He's asked her to marry him. She said, I love you. They've never even kissed. What if this was so bad, guys? What if he had one of those mouths that locks around your mouth like a remora? Have you ever kissed somebody like that? Oh, it's the worst, you guys. I will never forget. There was one guy I went on a date with, and this man literally sucked half my face off. It was like, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he just decided to like lick my cheek. He was that far off. It was just uh, the kind of moment that... It takes everything in you to not physically recoil in an outright offensive way. And dude really thought he had done something. He had this look on his face like he knew he had just impressed me. And that kissing was like, you know, something that he prided himself on. It was it was so bad. I I remember to this day the feeling of the ring of spit around my mouth. So I am just saying, everybody that as you can love somebody all of that great but you never know what you're dealing with when it comes to this sort of thing and it can go really wrong and this is why i believe in premarital sex in some ways i think it would be ideal to have pre-date sex and then you can just know if you're wasting your damn time on a date because i don't want to date somebody that i don't want to fuck and it really sucks to get feelings for somebody and then find out they can't fuck like that's the worst So I'd rather find out whether they can fuck first and then whether I want to invest any time in them. So personally, that's like the order I like. But I'm just glad for their sakes that they all worry that we're having a good time. This all worked out. But I'm just saying it could really easily have not. And just keep that in mind, everybody. You don't know. Like, the thing is, when you are somebody who approaches kissing and sex in the way that the majority of the population does. It never enters your mind how wrong some people can get it because only a maniac would do it that way. So you don't even like consider it. And then all of a sudden you've got somebody who like opens their mouth to kiss instead of closing it. And you're watching this person come at you and you don't even know how to react. Anyway, (laughs) I'm sorry. I (laughs) <laughs> um, the, the Ilian comes in at this point 
And he sees them kissing passionately and is like, oh, so can I congratulate you? And he's like, no, I don't understand. That's quite all right. <laughs> so this is when she comes out and uh, Alfredi is again, don't go in there alone. It's all right. What did he want yesterday? I told you to arrange for the marker. That didn't take two solid hours. And you came back looking like death warmed over. Another key thing. I forgot about that part that she's like, you left, you were gone way longer than it should have taken for the thing. And you looked like shit when you got back. So she's assuming that it's part of like torture, mental abuse, whatever. We know it's because she just got let in on like a pretty awful secret. And she had to say to the love of her life, sorry, I can't. So she had a pretty bad day, but it looks like a totally different kind of bad day to this woman. <clears throat> anyway, uh, <laughs> Cordelia just waves this off. Um, and she, when she goes in, this is such a wild moment, you guys. So this technician comes in and he has got a float palette with all these canisters on it. And Vorkosikin looks at this and is just like, has no idea what's going on. And Cordelia sees them, knows what they are, and is just like, oh God. And like clearly is just having a moment. And Vorkosikin is like, what are they? And the tech says, all your bastards. I thought it was the ashes of soldiers and he was like here are your fucking bastards back like bastards insult not bastards the actual literal meaning of the word originally and it took me a second cordelia is saying they're uterine replicators i was like oh so what we've got here is a bunch of women who were raped by barriaran soldiers got pregnant with their rapist baby and then those babies were removed from their bodies the fetuses were taken and put into these containers where they continue to develop and can actually be brought to full term in the canister what this is wild like if only this were uh, an option because I like and when I say an option I don't even mean like the tech of it because I bet that probably we could come up with something you know my issue is more like there are already so many children that are not cared for in the world I don't feel like keeping more of them around that nobody seems to want is a good idea but what I'm saying is, if there were a way for a person to remove an embryo and give it to a person and be like, I know that you want this child and to take, like, bring it fully into the world and be able to hand that off in this way, rather than having to go through the pain of pregnancy and childbirth and then hand over a fully developed baby, which is like a very different thing to have to do. I feel like the, it could be such a godsend to people in certain situations, you know? Um, but the situation here is the women don't want them. The soldiers, we don't even know who they are. And this guy is like, well, there are DNA things that you can find out who the fathers are. It shouldn't be an issue. And Vorkosigan says something like, well, what should I do with them? And I love this. What the hell am I supposed to do with them? Thought you were going to make our women answer that question, did you? Said the, replied the med tech, taut and sarcastic. That is such a good answer. I loved it so much. And uh, <laughs> she says, maybe... They just didn't want to argue about you taking them home with any of the mothers. A couple of them were pretty emotionally divided about abortions. This puts the blood guilt on you. Her words seemed to enter him like bullets, and she wished she'd phrased herself differently. 
And I didn't love the term blood guilt about choosing an abortion. How, like, I've had an abortion, full disclosure. I am fully pro choice, unsurprisingly. I have never, even for a moment, regretted getting it. It's, I actually thank God that I got one at least once a week. I think all the time about, oh my God, if I had had that fucking kid, like, how my life would have just, it would have been bad kids. It really would. So I don't feel any blood guilt at all. And I don't love the use of that term. However, I do feel like she's using that term to refer to the way the mothers were feeling who were afraid to take that step. I feel like it's a very particular, you know, I don't feel like she's passing a judgment. I feel like she is explaining the way they were feeling. So it didn't bother me. Um, and he says, 17, God, Cordelia, what do I do with them? How long will they keep working? The whole nine months, if necessary. Um, so he signs for them. And when she's like, well, what do you usually do with soldiers by blows? This has to have come up before. And he says, we usually abort bastards. In this case, it seems to have already been done in a sense so much trouble. Do they expect us to keep them alive? I don't know. What a thoroughly rejected little group of humanity they are. Except, but for the grace of God and Sergeant Bothari, one of those canned kids might have been mine. And Verutchers, or mine and Bothari's. What would you have me do with them? And she thinks, it must be quite a shock to suddenly find out you're pregnant 17 times over at your age. And she doesn't say it out loud, but I kind of wanted her to. <laughs> and she's like, you should take care of them. I mean, you did sign for them. I love when he asks the tech who brought them, he says, uh, I suggest you hang them around their father's necks. <laughs> oh, you guys, can you imagine? Can you imagine if men couldn't just walk away from the woman they impregnated? If this could be done and they could just be saddled with carrying the fucking canister around and dealing with it. Oh, man. Like, it's I don't want children to be used as punishment, which is what it is. Whenever anybody is like, well, she shouldn't have had sex then if she wasn't ready to be a mother. You're saying she should be punished for having the kind of sex you don't like by raising a child, which is insane. You're like, she was irresponsible. Let's have her raise a kid. What in the fuck is the matter with you? So I don't encourage using a child as a punishment. However, men are so insulated from the consequences of pregnancy in so many ways that it would be beautiful if you could just give them a little taste of what women have been dealing with for like millennia. Um, God, I'm losing my voice. Do you guys hear this? I don't know what's happening. So here comes the surgeon. This, this dude, he calls this an obscene gesture, which is kind of wild considering the obscenity of how these things came to be. And then says, why not just flush them? Some unmilitary notion about the value of human life, perhaps, said Cordelia hotly. Some cultures have it. Cordelia, ma'am, calm down. I don't want to talk about the sanctity of life in this situation, to be honest. Like, I just don't. But <laughs> Vorkosigan hands him the disc with the instructions and he's like, sweet, can I empty one out and take it apart? And he's like, the fuck you can. You're caring for these things. And he says, how the devil did they maneuver you into that? Oh, well, I'll get one later, maybe. This man is so excited about this tech and does not give any shits at all about the fetus inside it. Uh, Vorkosigan says, do you have any facilities to handle this? And he says, Imp Mill would be the only place and they don't even have an obstetrics department. But I bet research would love to get hold of these babies. 
And Cortilla realizes he's talking about the jar when he says babies, not the fetuses, which is fucked up. The whole thing is like all messed up. <laughs> oh, God. Um, and he says there must be 10 written kilometers of instructions. Uh, no, we don't. I'm afraid you'll have to eat your word this time. Vorkosigan grinned, wolfishly and without humor. Do you recall what happened to the last man who called me on my word? The surgeon's smile faded into uncertainty. These are your orders, then. In 30 minutes, you personally will lift off with these things for the fast courier, and it will arrive in Vorbar Sultana in less than a week. You will go to the Imperial Military Hospital and requisition by whatever means necessary the men and equipment needed to complete the project. Get an Imperial order if you have to. Directly, not through channels. I'm sure our friend Negri will put you in touch. Set them up, serviced, and report back to me. And he protests they can't make it in time for Kosigan's like, the fuck you can't, and like explains exactly how he can do it. And the surgeon is still arguing. This man needs to be put in his place hard. I needed a moment here. And I didn't quite get what I was looking for. <laughs> so <clears throat> at first he accuses him of bait and sentimentality. And then he says the words, I can sympathize with your wish to impress your girlfriend. But think ahead, sir. You did not just say that to him. Oh my god. What the fuck is the matter with you? Sir. Oh my god. Like, the, the fucking stones on this guy to say this. The only thing I can assume is because he was like in on this weird plan to kill the prince with Vorkosigan, he feels like the two of them are peers in a way that they are not. And just the fact that he dared. Oh my god. Vorkosigan literally growls at him. And I was like, I guess. I feel like you could just deck him. I would prefer that, honestly. But okay, growl, fine. And when he leaves, he tells her it just takes him a while to get his thinking turned around. But by the time he gets there, he'll be acting like this was his idea the whole time. Which, uh, that's a really interesting assessment of his character. I'm curious about that. But I will say, I have my eye on these little things, guys. I don't know, like, if nobody wants them, if nobody's interested, maybe maybe we could just raise our own little private army. Or Kosigan, maybe you could, uh, I don't know, adopt them, make them, you know, loyal, have a little crew. We're going to do Attack of the Clones here, but it's not clones. <laughs> anyway, chapter 12. You guys, this is so awful. So Cordelia is just being put through this like gauntlet of psych officers that are trying to get her to share in group therapy. But the thing is, she didn't go through the same thing that other people went through. And I'm just going to mention here too. A couple episodes ago, I mentioned a woman in the room with her that had, like, when she gets put into a separate place. And I realized later that I had overread, I was listening on my audiobook, and I, I, like, allowed it to continue playing. So I mentioned that woman before she actually shows up in the chapters that I was meant to be covering. So I like kind of spoiled listeners and I guess I had spoiled myself, although I didn't, I only remembered that. I did not remember her eventually coming to the conclusion that she had not been drugged, but I just want to, in, in case anybody is like out there keeping track and you spotted that I like mentioned something I shouldn't have known yet. I just want to cop to that and not be like there suddenly be a conspiracy theory that I actually listen ahead and pretend not to know stuff because if I ever listen ahead, it's by accident. I never do that on purpose. Um, but that girl 
is she was the other victim that was still alive. It's not mentioned that there was anything about her appearance indicating injuries like physical harm i'm sure there were and that it was just somehow covered in these pajamas that she was wearing or whatever but she's described as like extremely beautiful and so nothing was done to her face i guess and we don't get any further details on that but it was just uh like it, it must be very strange to like be in a room with somebody who suffered something that you almost suffered and just managed to escape. Like, I feel if I were in the room with her, there would be such guilt, even though it's not my fault that I got rescued, you know, like, but it's hard when there's not a rational reason why you managed to get out of it and another person had to be subjected to it. To feel like you're going to feel like, why? That's unfair. You know, you're relieved, of course, but what an odd sensation. So anyway, she's being like asked to share, declining. It starts to become more and more obvious that she's not sharing. And there are people pretending to befriend her, but who are obviously like plants attempting to get her to chat with them as if it's some casual conversation when it's a fucking it's a interrogation, you know, and eventually this woman is telling her, oh, so you don't remember being tortured or raped and you don't remember killing him. And she's like, I wasn't tortured and raped and I didn't kill him. I had made that clear. The doctor shook her head sorrowfully. It's reported you were taken away from camp twice by the Barriarans. Do you remember what happened during those times? Yes, of course. Can you describe it? She balked. No. Girl, you absolutely needed to have come up with something by now. Come on. Really? You have had all these chances, all of these share sessions. Write a story. Come up with something. Just being like, no, I'm not telling you. What do you think they're going to think? Come on. Oh, God. So she tries to say about like the marker and this lady's like, we get it. It's all been covered up. I know they were trying to protect his reputation. You're right about the other girl, Cordelia went on. I'm glad she's getting what she needs, but you're wrong about me. You're wrong about Verretcher's reputation, too. The whole reason they put out this stupid story about me was because they thought it would look worse for him to be killed by a weak woman than by one of his own combat soldiers. And then Sprague is like, you have physical evidence of torture. And Cordelia is like, what are you talking about? And she's like, you had a broken arm, two broken ribs, contusions on your head, your hands, your arms. Your biochemistry had symptoms of stress, sensory deprivation, weight loss, sleep disorders. And Cordelia talks about like the, the retreat and how everything was being shaken around, shook around. And that was when she broke her bones. And the doctor's like, very good, very good indeed. Subtle, but not subtle enough. Your bones were broken on two different occasions. And it's just so frustrating the way that she's like patronizing her and just being like, yes, yes. Oh, girl. So <clears throat> the doctor tells her, you should consider drug therapy. They've done a cover up on you. It's going to be necessary in your case. And we must have your voluntary cooperation. We find out later. That's a real flexible term here. Voluntary cooperation implies permission ahead of time. But we find out that they can request permission after the fact and that's considered adequate. Which, um, yeah, that feels like not what the words mean that you're using. But sure, why don't we just decide things mean whatever we feel they mean? Go ahead. <sighs> so, at this point, she begins to really withdraw. She's having difficulty sleeping because she's worried that they're going to somehow question her while she's napping, could pop, pop, possibly drug her even. Um, and she is starting to develop like ticks. 
uh, plagued by pounding headaches, insomnia, and a mysterious left hand tremor and the beginnings of a stutter. So yeah, all this therapy that's meant to like assist her in overcoming her demons is just wrecking her and she is fraying. So at this point, <clears throat> she gets, uh, she gets home and is welcomed in a way that she wasn't expecting. She gets expeditionary force uniforms and is like <laughs> the stewardess smiling extraordinarily. Why don't you go ahead and put them on? Why not? <laughs> she puts on the boots. Whoever designed these should be forced to wear them to bed. Uh, so they get to the dock and the stewardess says, the president's going to make a speech. It's very exciting. Even if I didn't vote for him. She has never met a single soul who has voted for this man. How is he president? How did this happen? Nobody. Everybody goes out of their way to say that they didn't vote for him. Steady Freddy. What are you doing? Who are you? What is this? Why do they all call him that anyway? What's his deal? Weird. I don't like it. So. <clears throat> she is planning. The, or no, he, the president is planning this massive speech. And gives her a script to read. And it is a fucking complete from beginning to end fabrication. And uh, she goes up there and she starts to read it. And then, you know what? Fuck this. And she just says, yeah, this didn't happen. I don't see what's so noble about butchering that sadistic ass for a ear. And I wouldn't take a medal for murdering an unarmed man, even if I had done it. For the last time, I did not kill Varetyr. One of his own men killed Varetyr. He caught him from behind and cut his throat from ear to ear. I was there. He bled all over me. The press from both sides are stuffing you with lies about that stupid war. Damn voyeurs. Vorkosigan was not in charge of the prison camp when the atrocities took place. As soon as he was in charge, he stopped them. And her sound gets cut off. She is grabbed from behind and she chucks the medal at the president as she's being grabbed. When she's grabbed, she kicks and he has moved right into the kick, gets nailed right in the sack and goes down and it does not look good, man. She's hyperventilating. And they're taking drugs out and she's just saying, get that ampule away from me. No drugs, please. I'm sorry. There's something about her saying, I'm sorry. At the end, like she's so frightened that she'd be willing to take it back, even though it's the truth. That's so heartbreaking. Like it really bu bummed me out, guys. Um, so when she sees her mother, I already kind of talked about this and I'm out of time. I'm not out, but I'm almost out. And I feel like I've already made it clear how I feel about the conversation. But her mother is like, I don't understand why you're so sympathetic to him. Uh, he, he, Vorkoskin doesn't have a good reputation. He's not a murderer. And then when, when Cordelia says he's only killed three people that weren't in the line of duty, her mother says only three and clearly is not approving of this. Um, <clears throat> it all makes a lot more sense if you meet him in person, she offered hopefully. Cordelia's mother managed an uncertain laugh. He surely seems to have charmed you. It's, that's not a positive statement, Cordelia. Somebody telling you a person has charmed you is them calling you a sucker. You're a mark. That's not a compliment. And Cordelia is just not really hearing it. Um, she asks, like, well, then what does he have? Because it's not his looks. The other guy you were dating was way hotter. And 
she says he has power over people, not leadership exactly, although there's that too. They either worship him or hate his guts. And which category do you fall in? Well, I don't hate him. Can't say as I worship him either. She paused a long time and looked up to meet her mother's eyes square on. But when he's cut, I bleed. Oh, said her mother, whitely. I really love the term whitely. I get that it's meant to be that she's pale. But <laughs> this is the kind of thing that I kind of want to share with Rashawn and be like, anytime a person does something that you don't like, you can just say they did it whitely. <laughs> Her mouth smiled, her eyes flinched, and she busied herself with unnecessary vigor in getting Cordelia's meager belongings settled. Cordelia, I am begging you to read the room. My God, girl, what are you saying this to her for? She is so obviously not buying this as uh, the, the story you're telling. I know that you want her to, but Jesus Christ, you are not making this sound good. Like... It's She's telling everything all out of order without any context. And so, yeah, it sounds like bullshit, you know? So, then we get Bill coming to tell her that she has an obligation and that she won't be able to go back into the field unless she gets cleared medically. And she's like, oh, okay, so I have to do this. I have to meet with a fucking doctor. Great. And so she agrees. And we have this moment when the doctor says, do you mind if I smoke? And I was like, girl, this is really fucking abnormal. Don't let her smoke. That smoke is a drug. And then she takes a pill and she's like allergies. And I'm like, the fuck it is. That pill is to keep that smoke from affecting her. I was so mad at Cordelia for not seeing this girl. She's addled. I get it. She's got shit happening. But like, you really should have seen this. You really should have. Eventually, after she begins to like spill her guts way more than she should, she finally catches on to the fact that she is being drugged. And she tells them more than she should have done. She even says out loud, mustn't talk about the prince, that mountain of corpses. And she could have said something really dangerous there. It's in context just sounds like the description of what happened. Thank God. But, and she jumps up, takes the recorder and smashes it. I love this. Good for you, girl. Oh, God not supposed to do that idiosyncratic reaction most unusual and she pulled the doctor pulls an ampule and cordelia loses her shit and when cordelia tries to tell her i'm not fucking doing this with you ever again she tells her oh this is great your resistance is is like a future stage i didn't think we'd reach yet she tries to tell her you, your thinking has been violently rearranged. Your readouts practically went off the scales. <sighs> First of all, she was drugged. Secondly, go fuck yourself. I hate you. Oh my God. So... She goes and writes a letter to Vorkos again. How many people saw it coming that they would intercept her letter? After what just happened, Cordelia, baby, do you really think they're letting you write a letter to Vorkos again? And that they're going to let you send it to him? On what planet did you think this was going to happen? Use your head. Use your head. Christ's sakes. So, indeed, she gets a visit. They think this letter was in code. And they're like, we couldn't figure it out, though. You must be that clever. <sighs> These people. And the way that this, like, 
questioning happens. I love the fact that she just notices how Taylor keeps saying we are doing, we are d deciding our opinions on, and he never uses the word I. She tries to say, you don't believe that, do you? And he says, no, but she can tell in his voice, like, yeah, you do. So they basically are like, you are being taken away to a very special camp where we will go through all of this. And then when you come out, it'll be like, all of these terrible things never happened. And she's like, oh, okay, cool. You're just going to erase my personality. You're going to just like delete him from my brain. Yeah, um, I don't think so. And he says, if you're right and we're wrong, the fastest way you can prove it is to come along. And like, that's the trick, right? This is the thing, especially when you're somebody like me who really wants to be able to explain themselves, who always wants to like get people to understand my point of view and I over talk. I would be very seduced by the idea that I could convince them. But after having seen the way they turn what she says around on her, I think by now I would have realized that that was just a non-starter. You don't need to put yourself in their clutches where they can drug you at will. You're away from everybody that you could rely on for backup. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. <sighs> Remarkable ploy of the Barriarans, Meta expounded thoughtfully, concealing an espionage ring under the cover of a love affair. I might even have bought it if the principles had been more likely. Yes, Cordelia agreed cordially, writhing within. One doesn't expect a 34-year-old to fall in love like an adolescent. Quite an unexpected gift at my age, even more unexpected at 44, I gather. Exactly, said Meta, pleased by Cordelia's ready understanding. A middle-aged career officer is hardly the stuff of romance. <laughs> Taylor, behind her, opened his mouth as if to speak, then shut it again. He stared meditatively at his hands. <laughs> Just catching straight his right and left. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So she's like, all right, fine, I'll come. But will you let me fucking shower and get my stuff together? Like, I, guys, I just got here. And this sounds like it's going to be a long trip. And she putters around, grabs a belt. Meta's the only one in the room. And she strangles her with the belt and begins to to shove her head under water and question her about how many people are out there. This is brutal. And of course, there's absolutely no way after this that they don't think they were right. Of course. But there's no point trying to convince them at this point. Like, who cares? Then let them think they're right. Fuck them. And she eventually gets the answer that she needs, but she has to really push it. And there's a point where she's almost not sure if she would kill this woman or not. Like, she's just like, I, I think I might just do it. I think I could get to that point, actually. And it seems like uh, Meta has also come to that conclusion, because at this point, she just tells her. Four. Two outside the foyer, two in the garage. <laughs> so she drops her, gets her stuff, money, ID, all of that, and takes off. And Taylor is out in the hall and sees her and then just salutes her and lets her run. And I got to say, considering how shitty he was to begin with, I respect that. <laughs> he, he's just like, yeah, you know what? Fuck these people. <laughs> I don't know how he's going to explain that she just went right past him. But whatever. So she then is really smart about how she uses these two uh, journalists who are waiting outside. She pretends she's willing to do an interview that she's got, you know, stuff will blow it right open. All of this. And eventually she gets to a point where she can get information on freighters. And she tells the woman she's talking to to get this information from her. 
oh, there's also a couple of journalists who've been following me around. Can you like get rid of them? She used them for transportation here, but then she finds a way to like scrap them. Wonderful. I love this so much. And she flatters the shit out of this girl helping her in order to get the info. And then when she gets on the freighter, this little kid, you guys, she tries to tell him like they know you're trustworthy. That's why they chose you for this mission. And this kid literally blurts out, oh, they can't have found out about the cordalite. <sighs> Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say that, dude? I cannot. That is just, bless him. He's got to be like 10 years old. <laughs> that is just really funny. That killed me. Um. So finally, she's like, you'll get to meet all the, the big names from the expeditionary force when you get back from Escobar. And he says, can I ask you a personal question? Why not? Everyone else does. Why are you wearing slippers? I'm sorry, Pilot Officer Mayhew, that's classified. Oh, he went forward to lift ship. <laughs> I just, I love that. And then it ends with her saying that she leans her forehead against the, the packing case and wept silently for herself. After another chapter ending with wept silently for her enemies. And I kind of liked that symmetry so anyway i gotta wrap i'm so over time but thank you guys very much for hanging out with me uh those of you who were here present apologies for the delayed start because of the kitten but i'm sure you can understand my situation <laughs> and uh thank you to jeff for commissioning this one i'm really enjoying this book so far looking forward to more until next time toodaloo motherfuckers Spoiled Network Podcast.